Okay, so let's get started by looking at the fundamentals of a computer system. Now, this topic is about developing a mental model of a computer system in terms of its key components. So we're going to be looking at hardware, which is any physical component of a computer system that you can touch, and the software, which is simply any programs that it runs on. Okay, so let's take a minute to remind ourselves that computers are everywhere, and our understanding of computers mustn't just be restricted to our say laptop uh, PC or our desktop PC. We have to think of computers in terms of how they're embedded into everyday appliances like our fridges, microwave ovens, uh, mobile phones or cash machines, supermarket tills, even engines of modern day cars. These all run on computers. Okay, so all computer systems must have input devices that get data from the real world and convert it into a form that can be stored on the computer. Now, the obvious examples of an input device will be a mouse uh, or a keyboard, but also a microphone is another input device. Okay, so the input from these devices is processed and the computer system will generate the output. The output device we can think of as a computer screen or a speaker or even a motor that opens a greenhouse window. The fourth and last component of any computer system is its storage. Now the computer uses the stored data to perform processing and as a result of the processing input may generate data that is then in itself stored. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is the importance of computers. Now it's not too difficult to see the importance of that computers play in our lives. We only have to go through our, our day and track our activities throughout our day to see that we use computers not only at home, in school, we don't use them just for leisure, to work or to study, but there are also many places in between where we would be at the mercy of a computer. For example, if we were to go to a hospital, most of the equipment they run on will be run on computers. So it's not too difficult to imagine the difficulty we would experience if any of these computers stop working. For example, if our PlayStation was to go down, we may be a little upset. But it would be more serious if, for example, a banking system were to go down, we could lose our money or other people could access our money. Again, if we were to go back to the scenario in the hospital, if a hospital system was to go down, it could put people's lives at risk. So the more dependent we become on computers, the more important it is that they are reliable. Their reliability now in some instances, for example in hospitals, is far more important than the features that the computer system has. And that's something that system developers have to take into consideration when they design these systems. In that they have to place utmost emphasis on the reliability of the final system. So this brings us on to measuring reliability. So how do we know how reliable a computer system is? Well, we talk about the system availability, meaning how long is it available for? For example, if a system is down or unavailable for one hour in a 100 hour period, we say the system availability is 99% for this period. Now normally equipment manufacturers will quote average availability times over a specific, often a long period of time. Another way of measuring a system's reliability is to measure the length of time between system failures. So MTBF, which stands for mean time between failures is quoted by equipment manufacturers as an indication of how reliable the system is. So this brings us on to protecting against a system failure. So if the reliability of my system is important to a company, then they need to have a contingency plan in case something goes wrong. And one way they do this is to have hardware redundancy. Now all this means that is that if something were to go wrong, a spare part or a critical component is used in place or takes over from the one that is broken. So for example, if something was to go wrong on a commercial aeroplane, then the backup computers will take over as the primary computer begins to stutter. Now if a software or hardware problem were to occur, then the data is at the most risk. And now this is usually stored on a disk on a server somewhere else. Companies also make sure that they back up their data regularly. And this is because that computer systems are now so important to some companies that they can't function without them. So if a computer system was to go down, they wouldn't be able to trade. So what they do in that instance is to make sure that all their old data is transferable onto a complete new system. 
and there are companies that specialize the companies are called disaster recovery companies and they specialize in the transition from one system into a newer system by using the old data okay so now this brings us on to professional standards so we know that computer systems are complex so if everyone involved in creating using and maintaining a system wants to do everything their own way then we would have no idea how everything worked so there has to be a standard that everyone adheres to that everyone follows and is able to recognize as the way of doing things or we could say as the de facto de facto standards can be thought of as the most common way of doing something so as more and more people enter the trade they may look at the techniques that are already in place and they may agree that this is the best way of going about doing things so the more people that participate and adopt or accept a de facto way of standing the more it becomes established as the standard way of doing things so it's important to remember that de facto standards are not formally agreed upon people don't sit down in a committee and decide this is the way we're going to do it but the, rather de facto standards are adopted or informally agreed upon as the way to go about doing things Okay, so this brings us on to professional standards in system development. Now, there are several approaches or models that define how a computer system can be developed, and any new system starts off with the initial problem, idea, or need that has to be fulfilled. And that initial idea has to be analyzed uh, so a system can be created that satisfies the requirements of its initial need. Now, this system uh, creation can take weeks months or even years so every step of the way has to be documented and every logical step has to be defined and we have to be clear what each step involves okay so the first model we're going to look at is known as the waterfall model now this model defines definite steps that are completed one at a time and it guides the process from the beginning to the end so each step has specific output that has to be completed and it leads on to the next step you can, you can return to a previous stage, but only if you work through, back down through the stages. Another model would be RAD or Rapid Action Development. This, is, this involves far more client participation. So it starts with a prototype that is developed gradually into a full solution and customer feedback is required at each stage. Now, both these standards will be familiar to teams of developers. And they wouldn't need to learn any new methodology when they go from one job to the next. And anyone who was to join in the, or improve or build upon any of the work done previously wouldn't need to learn any of this stuff. They would have already been familiar with the concepts and the ideas from previous uh, work where they would work to the same standard. This brings us on to professional standards in coding. Now there are standards in coding that mean prof programmers can understand the work of previous programmers who may have worked upon something for example comments in code to outline the algorithm and define the purpose of each part of the program using professional standards also means that programmers do not plagiarize other people's work it protects people's intellectual property this is where the Copyright Design and Patent Act comes into play because it protects people's intellectual property rights. This act uh, recognizes the fact that people have produced original work that belongs to them and it stops them from being uh, exploited by other people who may try to usurp their body of work. So programmers' rights are protected by the Federation Against Software Theft. Now they seek to enforce the copyright laws and in doing so they protect the programmers rights however not all programmers want their work to be protected in this way and they actively work with other programmers and collaborate to create what is known as open source code now open source code means like-minded people come together share their work and build upon each other's work but with one agreement that any work created or built upon in open source code mustn't be sold by any other people or nobody must benefit in any way financially from open source or the work in which they've worked together to create so this brings us on to professional standards in documentation now just as there are professional standards in coding there are a similar set of recognized symbols and diagrams that are familiar to all people 
who create documents. The symbols used in these flowcharts or diagrams are industry standard and are understood by everybody. So for example, you could have your uh, logic diagram using not and or logic gates. These are all symbolized by standard symbols recognized by everyone. These common uh, standards that are understood and recognized by everyone have a number of advantages. Firstly, people can work in teams because they all recognize and appreciate everybody else's work because they work with their same design tools and diagrams. People can also move between companies because standards apply across the whole industry. You can also pick up somebody else's work because the code is the same. And you can also maintain somebody else's program when the customer's requirements change because you'll be familiar with the same annotation. The last uh, standard we're gonna look at is the professional standard for health and safety. Now, defective standards or informal agreements do not regulate health and safety. No, you have specific laws that have to be followed simply because people's lives or their well-being are at stake. So when developers uh, create a system, develop a system, the use of the system on a day-to-day -day basis has to be considered and developers design a system to meet the health and safety regulations as laid down by the law. Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at is the considerations when creating a computer system. Now developers, when they're given the task of creating a system, have to take into account the system requirements, the money available and the time scales that this system has to be completed in. But there are also legal, ethical, environmental considerations that they have to take aboard and these will all affect their design outcome. So the first uh, consideration that designers have to take into account is the legal considerations and this relates to the number of laws that designers have to follow in creating a system. The first law that designers have to adhere to is the Data Protection Act. Now this says that anyone who stores personal details has to keep them secure and they're responsible for their security. So companies with computer systems that store any personal data have to have processes and security mechanism designed into the system that meet this requirement. The second one is the Health and Safety at Work Act. Now this essentially makes employees responsible for their staff while they're at work. So you have to pro uh, provide appropriate conditions in which it is safe for people to work in and you have to consider the health implications as people move around and use the system on a day-to-day -day basis. The third act that we need to know about is the Copyright Design and Patents Act. Now this makes it illegal to use software without buying the appropriate license. Now when a computer system is designed and implemented, licensing must be considered in terms of which software should be used. I mean, is open source the way to go because of the fact that it's cheap or in the long run is propriety software worth it? Will it offset the cost of the initial purchase by saving money in the long run? Okay, so the second consideration we're going to look at is the ethical consideration and this seeks to address questions about fairness. For example, is it fair that some people can't afford computers or don't have access to computers? Is it fair that countries like India are exploited for their sort of cheap labor? And sh should companies be made to use local programmers and call centers? And does, does the system design disadvantage some parts of the community? Uh, or does the system design promote an accessibility for all? So these questions of ethics and fairness do come into play as programmers decide on what to design. Okay, so the last consideration we're going to take a look at is the environmental consideration. And this relates to issues surrounding the carbon footprint and the waste product that result from manufacturing systems. But this can often be outweighed by the positive effects on the environment of using systems that, uh, that manage maybe processes that might otherwise generate even more pollution. So the considerations we would have to take into account include, does a computer system mean that more people can work from home and therefore they drive less? Uh, can a system mean more manufacturing? Is working at home more environmentally friendly than, say, everyone working in a big office where they're using up heating and lighting? And can computer-generated engines work more efficiently, uh, using up, say, less pollution and uh, meaning less pollution and using less fuel? 